Welcome to Must Know ADU Strategies for 2023, presented by ADU Resource Center. I'm your host, Danny Johnson. The goal of this broadcast is to create an informational hub for homeowners planning an ADU project of their own. This will be an ongoing webinar beginning in January of 2023 with special guest speakers from our industry so you can get a variety of tips and information to strategize your very own ADU project. Some of the topics we're going to cover are updates and tips for financing solutions, information on the Cal Hefa ADU grant, and new legislation laws for ADUs and more. ADU Resource Center began building custom and track homes in California and Florida back in 2010. In 2020, new legislation changed ADU restrictions for most city ordinances in California. We saw this as a new opportunity and wanted to pitch in and help affordable housing solutions. That's when we changed our DBA to ADU Resource Center and never turned back. Our company is now ADU specific, meaning that's all we build. Since our transition, we now have over 300 plus ADU projects in various stages of permitting, planning, and construction. We are well on our way to becoming the fastest growing and largest ADU builder in California. Southern Californians have chosen ADU Resource Center as their first choice for project concept designs, architectural design, structural engineering, Title 24 engineering, low impact development planning, plan submission, revisions and retrieval, licensed general contracting, landscape and hardscape design all under one company so we can effectively manage the entire project from beginning to end and to streamline better communication, coordinate smoother handoffs between <laughs> divisions and teams and reduce mistakes with more eyes on your project. And now let's begin our program. Can I share my screen? Okay. Well, I welcome everybody. I'm sorry about the little delay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Susanna, can you hear me? Absolutely, yes. Okay, all right. So I'm going to share my screen. Host is disabled. I can't share a screen. Try that. All right, let's see. Uh, here we go. Let me know when we can all see the screen. Beautiful. All right. So um, before we dive in, let's kind of talk about uh, what we've got going on. So uh, I want to introduce a couple of people to my right is my, my co-partner and co-host, uh, Sean Sarabi, and uh, director of operations and driver of the Winnebago. <laughs> uh, over on the tech desk, we've got Vic Gadimian, and he's going to be doing sound and lighting for us tonight as well. Thanks, Vic. Mike, you just got back from uh, Japan. How was your trip? Oh, it was a uh... Amazing, amazing. Absolutely. 30 days in Japan. I'm, I bet you're tired. You're, you're sorry to be back. Yeah, I'm glad to yeah, have you. Was... All right. Well, tonight we have, so on a, with an ongoing um, webinar, we always try to keep the show fresh. And so we are answering all the questions that you guys want to talk about. And one of the things that's on everyone's mind is, I, I would say two topics that are most important is financing. How do I finance my ADU project? And Another comment that's coming up a lot more recently that uh, we need to learn a little bit and talk about is legislation for SB9 lot splitting. So uh, I have three guest speakers on the panel tonight and we'll be talking to them and that will be Maris, Meredith Stowers, CEO and founder of Cross Country Mortgage. Uh, we've got Susanna Rhodes, uh, Change Mortgage and Vice President of Reverse Mortgaging and Karen Moore, Vice President of Lending for Trillion Capital. So all three lenders have their different programs. Hi, Meredith. I was wondering where your pretty face was. You're muted, I can't hear you. You're still muted. I'm muted. Vic, you're gonna un Vic's gonna unmute you. Huh? You should get notified. Admit. So we still got people straggling in. So as you guys see people come in, just admit them in. Meredith, are you muted still? Yeah. Now, Karen, I can hear you, right? Let me hear you. Susanna, can I hear you? Hi there. Hi, uh, you're, you're there. Muted, so Meredith is on. muted. She's back. Yeah, she's back. We can't hear Meredith. 
she needs to unmute. I think she tried logging in on her phone. Huh? I think she tried logging in on her phone and muting her. Computer. Okay. Uh, let me see. Where's my third panelist, Karen Morris? Karen, there. Are you are you still with us, Karen? I don't. I don't hear her. Let me see if I can see her. Oh, uh, there she there. I can't hear you. Vic, we can't hear Karen. Yes, I was muted and restricted from the chat. Uh, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. All right. So is our chat up and running, Vic? Because I want them to post uh, their info and their web links. I'm going to actually show uh, stuff for each of you, but I know that you guys want to sometimes post your own stuff as well. Can everybody see my screen? I that's good. Okay. So, um, Meredith, can I hear you yet? I can't hear her. I cannot hear her, Vic. What are we going to do? Uh, what number are you, uh, Meredith, maybe in the chat, you can tell me what number you're logged in from your phone with and I can unmute you. I can do all the minutes. Well, we got a lot of people so, coming yeah, in still. A lot of people still. Okay. Well, we got to start with Meredith. She's our first speaker. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it says you're a co-host and you're not muted. It's on your end. You need to unmute or maybe look at your microphone. Perhaps if she's on her phone and on the computer at the same time, it's causing an issue. So well, now you're muted. Now Meredith's muted. Okay, no? now she's not muted anymore. I can't hear her. Yeah. So, yeah, we can't hear you, Meredith. You, you might need to join with can... computer audio on your side. Do you guys yeah, hear her? She's not. No, she's not. Hear her. Uh, Mary, did you want to call in from a cell phone, maybe? Or go back to your computer? Sometimes I'm using this before. And what is Mary's phone number? I'm going to Do you know her number? She posted it in the chat. Oh. Uh, uh, 10 18. Okay, here we go. As to other. Okay. So I, I unmuted you on the phone number. Ah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Welcome. There we are. I'm sorry, guys. I'm having technical difficulties. It's like a it's, tsunami down here. Listen, don't get us started. Yeah. We uh, we were we were sitting here uh, kicking it, and when, then all of a sudden we realized uh, we're we're ten minutes away, so we got a little behind ourselves. I apologize to all of you for waiting, and I'm glad you're all here. And we have a great show. So what I want to do is I want to maybe share a, a presentation and then I want to have, I'm going to start with you, Meredith, okay? Because what yeah. I, I, I'm going to um, kind of break this down into three different things to talk about the financing. We'll go with the financing first and we'll go with, uh, I think I want to go with legislation last. So let me open up uh, all about financing and then I'll share that with everybody and then we will get started. Uh, where is it all about? Oh, here we go. There we go right there. Let me know when everybody can see the screen. Yep. Yep. All right. So um, I'm going to have you talk first, Meredith, then uh, we'll have Susanna and then Karen follow up. And then here's how we go. So let me just kind of go through this little uh, thing I made and let's talk about it and let's see what we can learn. So the, uh, let me get this out of the way. I can't see it. Okay. So in financing, I kind of look at them like three different categories. <clears throat> and I, I look at it, the traditional financing, standard home loans and fixed second trustee loans and so forth. Um, there's HELOC loans and lines of credit. There's new construction HELOCs that are out there. Um, there's some specialty needs uh, loans as well. There's uh, hard money loans, uh, asset, based, uh, asset based, and then reverse mortgages. So before we go into all these three things, let's just kind of break them down one at a time. And I'll have everybody who specializes in their, their specific loan. Although I think all of you do probably most of these, if not all of them, but I'm going to have you address specifics. So Meredith, let's talk about traditional financing first. So a lot of the customers that we are talking to recently, they say, look, there's a little dilemma. We have a good rate now. We've got a very, very good rate. We did it during COVID. And we're not sure, are we supposed to do a cash out refi now 
when we have a better rate ourselves, um, we don't want to touch the rate. So what we're trying to figure out is we know we want to do an equity-based solution loan because that's going to give us the lowest rate. But what are what are our options out there? What are the choices? Well, I'm so glad that you mentioned that and you have the entire crew here because between um, Karen and everybody and I, you have the full arsenal of residential lending. And um, I work particularly with Trillion Capital and they're phenomenal for investors. Um, so we collaborate together to get you the best um, interest rate and you know, options for you among probably more than 400 loan options. Lately with traditional financing, nobody wants to touch their first mortgage, whether they're an investor or a primary. So we've been focusing on home equity lines of credit, HELOC, and um, those are interest only. Um, and they're typically between six and 9%, which everybody says, ooh, wow, ooh. But you know, typically you start a project for $10,000, maybe on designs, that's 80 bucks a month. It's kind of like a giant credit card leaned against your home. So you spend 10,000 at today's high rates, it's 80 bucks a month. And then, you know, next month it's 75 because the rate's variable and it's coming down. Ultimately, Fannie Mae is projecting will be at 4.3% in nine to 12 months. And ultimately that, that monthly payment will be $41 a month. So um, that's mostly what people are focusing on with the HELOCs. We even have a construction HELOC, meaning if you just bought your house and you have no equity, that's okay. We Those are based on up to 125% of future value and future ADU rental income. So, hang so on. there's a lot of good let, options. Let me mm -hmm. slow you down right there because I don't want you to run past that because that just, my ears perked up. So let me give you a scenario. Got somebody bought a mm -hmm. house uh, not too long ago. They want to do, they need to do an, uh, they need to do an ADU. The, either a family member has nowhere to live and they need to bring them in or they're in mm -hmm. dire need of mailbox money. So the ADU project is not a want, it's a need item, right? But they're right. torn. Do I wait for my house to gain equity? And it may take one, two, three years to do the project I want. If I have a customer that has a $200,000 project, for example, um, and they don't have enough to do all of it, so do they wait? So explain how the future value might work in that example. Yeah, actually today's event is a perfect timing for anybody getting started on an ADU project now. Um, so typically we see designs take two to three months um, and, and, you know, maybe 10,000, again, 80 bucks a month. And then permits take, you know, three to five months. That's, you know, rates are lower. By the time you're done, rates should be back to very, very low levels. So 97% of what you're going to spend is really on construction. And that's where you really need the money. So I think to address the first question, I personally think the timing is perfect. Um, and but no, you do not need to have. Also, if you purchase a home and you don't have any more income to qualify, we can use the future rental income on this particular loan. And that's very rare to get you qualified. Now, I heard a rumor. I heard a rumor that this construction HELOC, and we've been waiting for this a long time. It just it just cleared Congress in late January, did it not? So this is only less than <laughs> a little over 30 days old. So traditional <laughs> HELOCs are different from this type of HELOC. This type of HELOC, I believe also, if I'm not mistaken, what if I have a debt to income ratio and they're a little tight on budget and there could be a borderline loan turndown on a conventional HELOC. The construction HELOC, if I'm correct, will actually let you score in future rental income, even though the project's not even built yet. Yes, absolutely. And people vastly underestimate how much rental income comes in from ADU. <clears throat> it's incredible. Right, okay. That's the best part of my job. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you think if we're talking about maybe leaving the first mortgage alone because they have a very, very good rate? Are you speculating that rates are normalizing? Will they be at a pre-COVID rate sometime this, maybe this time next year, which would be a great time to refinance if they did a HELOC? 
Yes, um, I'm not speculating. Fannie Mae is officially forecasting 4.3% this time next year. I think they're, it's a little <laughs> little low, but, but even 4.5%, you're talking about $420 for every 100,000. So a $200,000 project, you know, you're talking about 840 bucks a month. And the rents are incredible. The rents in Los Angeles alone start at about 2,500 for a studio um, and go up from there, So, which is really exciting. You know, we have customers in disbelief. When we give them the forecast of what rent is, they go, there's just no way. And I said, no, hang on a second. You got to remember when the roof pe got peeled off and we all started earning all this equity during COVID, it's like we dropped fertilizer on our properties and they, they blossomed, right? What people don't think about is so did rents. Rents went up at an equal trajectory like home values. So people are in disbelief of what, or, I mean, you're, they're almost embarrassed to say, I would never charge somebody that much rent. Well, if you, <laughs> Google, if you Google it, that is the actual going rate, isn't it? It's, it's amazing. Yes. Rent actually went up about uh, three times what home prices went up. So if you think home market prices are outrageous, take a look at rent. So we're not gouging. It's just what the market will bear. And if everybody is seeing the same rents out there and you are a homeowner that's going to build an ADU, why wouldn't you at least bring it up to par to get what you're, I mean, that's the return on the investment. That's the whole point of building it, right? Absolutely. And, and to be honest, if you want to be super charitable and you have a heart for Still making money even by renting for low income or for charity purposes. I mean, there's a million or for family. Okay. I mean, you know, yeah. So let me go down to bullet points that I've got because I've got bullet points for the other types of loans too. So your loans typically require qualifying for the loan, which means they have to have credit. They've got to have a FICA score. They have to have equity and they have to have proof of income, correct? Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, we are now going to move on to our next one. I'm going to do home equity line of credit. We've already talked about, I just wanna make sure that we understand there's a standard home equity line and there's a construction home equity line, which is what we just talked about, which is the new one, which I think is the secret weapon for ADUs, but um, they still gotta qualify. They have to have equity or not. Uh, requires a good credit score and they have to have proof of income, yes. But their income could also yeah. be, it could also be a future income after the ADU is built. That's right. And credit scores are very manipulable, as everybody knows. Um, minimum credit score is 680 for the construction HELOC. For other HELOCs, we go as low as 600. Okay. And to be clear, a home equity line of credit is simply a checking account, and you only make payments on the portion that you use. So if we know that the first six, maybe seven months is permits and planning, they're not going to be spending a great deal of money. They might spend $20,000 or something on city fees and architectural plans and engineering. So what would the payment be to finance the architectural plans? Probably um, for the architectural plans, probably about 80 bucks at today's rates. But by the time you get to permits, I think the whole shebang, you're looking at maybe 190 bucks a month. Kind of like a credit card statement. You only pay on what you use. So if we spent, so if we were in planning for six months, they've spent a grand, let's just call it $200 a month. They spent a grand total of $1,200 to get yep. through, through the planning and permit stage. And they didn't deplete their cash savings writing big checks, correct? That's exactly right. Exactly right. Now, when the construction is about ready to start, we know that most mm -hmm. construction jobs last three to five months. Let's just say a garage conversion might take three months, providing we have building materials, but a standalone a detached might take five months. So if we said five months, you know, and it's a $200,000 project, we'll say, okay, what is the monthly payment on that $200,000 for that five months? And how much did we spend grand total until it's finished and done and built? Yeah, so maybe your first payment is 50,000. So that's gonna be, you know, maybe um, $225 for month two. And then, you know, and then each month it goes up just a little bit, just a little bit. But when you get to, two, let's say 200,000, 
that's going to be about $840 a month. And you're going to laugh, but we can take out a little bit of money extra to help you make those payments. So if money's really tight, just pull out a little bit extra using the loan to make your payments during construction. But ultimately, your renter, once your renter's in, it more than pays for itself. We typically see these loans, if people use all of the rent to pay down the loan, you can pay it off in about five to seven years. So the thing that it, that kind of intrigues me is to get the project built and finished in 12 months time. They're not going to have spent a great deal of money out of that HELOC account to get it done, or at least their monthly payment is not so much. So then when the project is done, the property is reassessed, it's reappraised. They've got all this equity because of the square footage they put in. Now that would be a great time to do a wraparound and combo the construction HELOC with their existing first, even though their existing first might be at a slightly lower rate, the blended rate would be a no brainer, wouldn't it? Usually it is, but you know, <clears throat> it's my job to put out the options side by side and they make the decisions. I need to give you an apple to apple comparison to make that decision. Cause some people are really, you know, emotionally connected to that interest rate. To me, it's all about cash flow. When you're really looking at the cash flow, what makes the most sense? But everybody's different. Okay. All right. So, okay. So I think that that's good. So we are going to move on now to specialty loans. And um, Susanna, I think I changed my mind. I think I want to have you be the closer on this one. I think I want to talk to Karen with Trillion first. And then we're going to save the the reverse for the last. Is that is that okay with you, Susanna? Of course. Okay. Karen, where yes, are sir. you? Hello. All right. Hey, how are you? Welcome. Let me pull up your, 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 can you see my screen still? I still sure can. Okay. So Karen, you are with uh, Trillion Capital. Are you out of San Diego? I'm not. So we're located in our own territory. So I'm LA and Orange County. I live in Long Beach, right in the middle of it. <laughs> okay, and, and so I think Meredith works with your San Diego counterpart down yes. there. Yes, right? Bruce okay. May, yes. Great, yeah. great. You guys do a great job for investors. Thank it's you. It's always a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Meredith. All right. So I have some notes on you because I think your program is, 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 is amazing, but I think there's a lot of people that don't understand why would I ever consider doing a hard money loan? And I think that if we have a cookie cutter program, if we have a cookie cutter program that they qualify, maybe they would just go straight to someone like Meredith. But every now and then we're going to have conditions where the loan cannot be approved. And right. this is where I think you really hit the bat uh, uh, on the ball. Um, your, I like your slogan. Every loan is analyzed on its own merit, not based on income or wealth. So you are an asset-based lending company that is not, I think, I, let me just show some of my, my notes. No minimum <laughs> interest. Yeah. No junk fees, no document fees, no draw fees, no personal guarantee. And those are the uh, things that make us stand out even from other um, hard money lenders. So hard money is not supposed to mean it's difficult. It's supposed to mean it's based on the hard asset itself. So some people don't realize that. Um, and yeah, it can be more expensive, but we can close so fast. I've closed a loan in, I hate saying this out loud because I don't want to do it every day. <laughs> But I've closed a loan in three days before. It's so you know, sometimes people use this just to take it down and then refi into something less expensive. And that's just fine. We have no prepayment penalty either. So um, you're not, you're just paying for the money when you're using it. Now, let me just, let's see if I can remember a couple of the important bullet points. Yes. Non, Non-owner occupied. Correct. They cannot live in the house. So this is an investor's dream, right? Yes. So if you're an investor on this webinar and you have multiple properties, you say, look, I need a loan, but I need it fast. I need it quick. Oh, by the way, I don't know if I'm going to qualify. My income's not what it could be or should be. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Karen, it they don't run credit reports. You don't need equity. You don't even need income. They're going to base it on you, the, the investors or homeowners' assets on the strength of who they are. Not on the homeowner's assets, on the project, on the asset <clears throat> is the project. So they don't have to have their own stuff even. So yes, it's, it's even easier than that. Um, and that's the beauty of it. It's because when you, 
when you're doing, especially when people are just getting started, we do lend to first time flippers, which makes it really fun because we get to see people grow and turn their new business into an empire, which is so fun to do. And it's so fun to lend to first time flippers as well, just to see them so excited about, you know, we, we don't charge for our draws because we do them ourselves. The VPs in our, in our areas, we do the draw inspections ourselves. So we don't have to pay a third party company. It can happen really fast. We typically get you your draw funds within just a few days by the third day after you request it and give us everything we need. And that just saves money. Time, time is money with these interests, you know, these loans. So the faster you can get your money, the faster you can get the work done and the faster you can be ready to resell. Great, great. Is um, your contact info posted in the chat yet? It sure is. And I will put it in again too with a little bit more detail, but I just stuck it in there right at the beginning. I already know Meredith and Susanna, they're, on, they're probably on there already. They're the first. So post it, make sure that they have an access to your appointment calendar. So um, how does the calendar work? So the calendar works like this. If you try to call Meredith, you might, I mean, you're going to get President Biden on the phone faster than if you try to get Meredith on the phone. So the only way to talk to busy people in our industry, because we're on the phone all day long, is to pick a time, pick a day, pick a time. That's your day. That's your time. And you are absolutely guaranteed. So it really makes a lot of sense. If you see their cal appointment calendars, click on it. And you are guaranteed to have a captive audience rather than going, when will somebody call me? So it's just a busy world and everybody's, we're in peak season right now. And so are all these lenders. So I love the fact that you have a courtesy calendar. Appreciate that. Um, Karen, is there anything that we should know? Uh, uh, you're a special interest solution. Anything that we didn't cover that's vital for people to know? Yes, one of the big things is we do provide proof of funds. So if you are new and you need to make offers, you're going to need to have proof of funds, and we provide that for you. It's a very, very simple process. There's about a two-page application, and then we just will give you what you need to be making offers in your market. And we like to give you an amount that will cover most of your offers so you don't have to come get a new one for every offer. You have it in your in your pocket, and you can use it when you need it. Um, I don't know if everyone... I don't. I don't know how experienced everyone is on this call, but I'm going to explain a little bit just for people that don't know how things work. Um, we we don't we typically don't require, like you said, a credit check, no financials. We don't ask for your taxes. We don't require appraisals, which is a really big deal because we evaluate it ourselves. So we know what we're getting into. Appraisals can kill a deal at the very last second, very often. And that's just a huge risk when you're putting your your name on the line saying you're going to buy something and then let you know an appraisal company come in and make it so that you can't do what you said you were going to do so that's that's a big important thing and it's um it, it's good for speed as well you don't have to wait on that um the idea of no prepayment penalty and no minimum interest is pretty big and again that means that you can just if you need to use us just to take down the deal and then refinance into something with Meredith that's much less expensive then that's absolutely fine and you don't have to pay a certain amount of interest just because you did the loan you have to You'll pay your points and you'll pay for the time interest for the time that you're that you have the loan. You can pay it off and then you're just done. Right. And what, right. Yeah. And what no junk fees means is um, and we enlisted a few of them here, but many and this is what sets us apart even from different hard money. <clears throat> There's they like, you know, they're oftentimes going to be a teaser rate in points. And I'll even tell you where we're at right now. Um, but then they make up for it in fees. So they do think like draw fees. And so this is when you're building your project and you um have we're giving you money as you're progressing so with draw fees they can be like four and five hundred dollars per draw so since we do it ourselves we don't have to charge for that no personal guarantee is a big deal That's the whole point of having an entity is that it's not you know your personal stuff isn't at risk but if you have to do a personal guarantee then it is <laughs> so you know it's kind of undoing that so we like to keep you in that that safe place um and it's just with us if you i actually don't have a calendar up there because you call me i i do ask the phone and if i don't i'll get back to you in the day and if i don't get back to you in the day do call me again <laughs> it's just because i get busy too just like everyone else but um but yeah we'd like to talk to you one-on-one -on -one. we want to build long-term relationships and you will be if you bring me a deal in my area even though i'm a vice president i still interact with you for the entirety of the loan so we'd like to take care of you and build a relationship and see you grow is there any cap on loan amounts loan amounts so we do um, residential, we also do apartment buildings. So even it's still considered residential to us, but we go up to about 36 doors, I think, for apartment buildings. Um, so with apartment buildings, we can go higher and it's, it's 
you know, honestly, Danny, it changes every day. So we're growing. So it gets large. You know, what we can take on gets larger. If the market isn't supporting high end homes, then we're not going to do a four, five, six thousand dollar purchase of a home of a single home in that market. So it, it changes all the time. And I just tell people, bring me your deal and let me tell you what I can do. You know, I'll Great. tell you what I can and can't do. Great. You know what I was going to do earlier and I forgot. I want to post this so that you guys can do a screenshot. I'm going to zoom in on Meredith and Susanna and Karen. So if you know how to do a screenshot, just hit that one right there. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Uh, on a PC, you hit the little Windows button and then you hit the PRTSC at the top, which for print screen, you'll see it change and that captured the screen for you. Uh, let's go back to. Hey, can I ask, Karen, what's your territory? Because this is important. It's not just Los <laughs> Angeles. Right. So I'm actually LA. Well, now I'm LA, Orange County, Inland Empire. Um, and I do some Santa Barbara as well. So, yeah, you know, we, we are only in California. I see some people asking in the chat. We are only in California right now, but we have Bruce, who's just amazing. He's in San Diego and he does all of the surrounding San Diego. I mean, I drive over an hour for lots of inspections, so we get as far as we possibly can. Um, and then we have a man named Dave Waite, who is also amazing up in the Bay Area. And he covers huge. He does Bay Area itself. I think he does some Sacramento. Um, so he's all over the place. There are areas we can't reach right now, and we will do more as we grow. But um, again, that's changing and flexing all the time. So just ask, and I can tell you what we can and can't do. Thanks for asking, Meredith. OK. Um, I think we are moving on. So uh, I'm going to go to the next specialty loan, which I know this one, for me, uh, I, I had a really good time. I made a PDF on reverse mortgages because as I'm getting, I, we, it, we try to keep the show fresh. We try to come up with content each month. And quite honestly, I didn't understand reverse mortgages nearly as well as I do now. So I want to welcome to the show, Susanna Rhodes. Are you there, Susanna? Hi. Yes, I sure am. How are you? Sorry about the wait. Glad to have you on the show. No, no. Right. I'm glad to be here. So I, um, I, I prepared this with your help. She had to edit it for me because I got a lot of things wrong. She goes, no, nope, not that. Don't say this, say that, do all that other stuff. But I tell you, I learned a lot in the process. So I made something and I decided that I was going to write it in a third person in the form of a story. Rather than just go down bullet points, I made a story out of it. So I'm going to show you what we created together. So I kind of call it the golden secret. And because... I think it's a, I think it's gold and it's a secret and people just don't realize the power of it. So um, let's just kind of go through. Not all loans get approved in today's market. One of the most common reasons is due to limited income. So if we have people that are on fixed income, let's face it, uh, Social Security doesn't always cut it. Many seniors are both surprised and saddened when discovering they cannot qualify for a traditional home refinance or HELOC for construction. I'm going to tell you a quick story. John lost his wife some years back and thought he should have his daughter live on the property just in case he had a fall or a medical emergency. His daughter, Julie, agreed but wanted her own space and not necessarily share the main house. This sounds common. It was decided that they would convert the garage into a studio apartment for her. She could come and go privately, yet still check on her, far, her father daily to make sure he's okay. After a meeting with their ADU designer and finding the best design for the new ADU, they contacted a few lenders next to see how the financing conversion could be done using some of the equity from John's home. He felt very, there was plenty of equity and it should be easy to use a portion of it. Uh, no problem. Julie also offered to pay $1,500 a month rent to help out. Okay. After meeting with a few lenders, both online and in person, it was determined by all lenders that the new loan amount uh, added to John's existing mortgage and monthly bills would disqualify him for his approval to buy his ADU. John asked for a refinance loan to consolidate his mortgage in, let's say his existing mortgage was $210,000. And the money needed for the new ADU was going to be approximately $150,000. The new loan consolidated together would be $360,000. 
John was turned down due to the uh, by with all the lenders due to his debt to income ratio, which means he would have too much debt and the payments would be a burden and a risk for the bank to approve uh, an additional loan commitment. This happens quite a bit with seniors that are on fixed income. Okay. Um, some of the data and background on John. Uh, John's income at 70 years old. He's getting $1,750 a month on Social Security. He's got a retirement pension of $2,200. So together, he's making $3,950 a month. His existing mortgage balance at $210,000 was $890 a month in monthly payment. He needed an additional $150,000 to convert the garage into an ATU. And that would mean he would need a grand total of $360,000 total. Okay. His social, his social security a month uh, retirement pension on income side was 2,200 plus uh, uh, the pension of 3,900. So here's how the debt to income ratio works. If you take your outgo and divide it by your income, if he, in his case, he was 61%. The chart shows over here, under 40% is desirable. Anything over that is in the danger zone, which is why he was turned down. Okay, so this is where the conversation for many customers would end. That means the idea of what he wanted to do is not going to happen. And many people resign themselves to the fact, not only am I not going to get the ADU and have my daughter live on the property where we can have meals together, um, I don't know what's going to become of me because if I have a fall and I get hurt, I can be in big trouble. So this is a very, very common uh, dilemma, and this happens a lot. Or does it? What if there was one good solution left? What if John didn't have to live alone and worry about dangerous fall or unexpected health emergency with no one around to help? <laughs> what if Julie could still live on the property and he can still have dinners together uh, a little bit longer? What if building a habitat on the property for Julie was actually affordable? What if adding new livable space to John's property also increased the home's value what if he could also collect a fair rent from Julie while she lives on the property to supplement his income? What if he could eliminate his existing mortgage monthly payment completely to have more income each month to live on? What if this newfound income created a financial freedom for John that relieved his stress month to month and improved his health and overall well-being? What if this new well-being allowed John to retire in comfort and do all the things he hoped retirement would bring, but never did? What if we show you what John did? If you really think you knew, you, if you really knew what you think you know about this type of mortgage loan, you would know why it's called the golden secret. This single loan alone has liberated more seniors in their golden years than any other loan because it allows financial freedom, freedom to live, freedom to choose, freedom from debt, freedom from worry, and freedom from burdening children for help. Let's dispel some of the rumors we've heard over the years about reverse mortgages. With a reverse mortgage, the bank will now own your, your house. Nope. With a reverse mortgage, the bank could steal your house from the kid's inheritance. Nope. Reverse mortgages have hidden fees uh, to the bank and the customers don't know about it. Nope. The whole thing sounds too good to be true. There must be something bad associated. No, here's the real truth. The real truth is you always own the home. You use some of the equity any way you like. You can travel, make home improvements or renovations, pay off bills, make investments, buy a new car, ca uh, give cash to your, your children, pull out, cash to have it, just because, eliminate a monthly mortgage payment completely, keep the property in a trust, set up an inheritance instruction so beneficiaries maintain ownership. This is what how it really goes. So let's show you what John went and did. I'll show you before, John's mortgage payment was 1890. He had medical insurance of $400 a month. He had household bills, utilities and so forth of about 340 bucks. He still has to pay his property tax and his, his property insurance. So his total monthly bills per month were $2,800. And his gross income was $3,950, which means he had left over a little over $1,000 to live on. After he did this reverse mortgage, 
He had no monthly mortgage. The mortgage went away completely. He had his medical bill. He's got his utilities as always. He's got his property taxes and insurance. Oh, um, he got his $150,000 to build the ADU, paid it off in cash. He also is collecting $1,500 a month rent from Julie. So now his total bills are $1,000 a month. He's got an income of $3,950, which he had in the beginning, plus $1,500 rent from Julie. He now has $5,450 a month in income. But what he wound up doing is he has $5,450 now to live on. And so the middle caption here, John's health improved over a new stress-free lifestyle. He now walks regularly, volunteers at the VA hospital, enters golf tournaments, visited four new states in his new RV, and planning a bucket list to uh, a bucket list trip to Italy next year, all because of this type of loan. Why does it work? In Southern California, our homes values increase annually at an alarming rate. In many cases, the high equity growth allows homeowners and lenders the confidence in using equity-based loans. John's income did perform with them. Here's how his house uh, performed over the last years. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over that. Who qualifies for this loan? Anybody over the age of 55? Homeowners with 50 to 55% equity in their home, they can qualify for a reverse mortgage, meaning that if your home is nearly paid off and you don't know what to do with it, well, here's one thing that you can do. Homeowners can, uh, who can pay for their own property taxes and insurance, you still have to maintain that, and homeowners who want financial freedom. So all of these things you can do with this uh, particular loan. So I kind of want to stop there and let's go back to Susanna. And Susanna, how did I do? You did great. Um, yeah. There's a couple of things, um, though, that I, I'd love to point out about reverse mortgages because I call it um, the last common sense loan because you don't live and die by your FICO score and you also don't live and die by your debt ratio like your typical loans. Um, so we're always talking about you know, debt ratio and not being able to qualify. The big deal with reverse mortgages is, of course, there's no mortgage payment, right? But the other part of it is that um, it's not your typical debt ratio, too. So with reverse mortgages, without having a mortgage payment, um, you could also be spending maybe, you know, feasibly 70% or more of your income towards, let's say, your bills and still qualify with a reverse because what a reverse looks at is, um, are you able to have sufficient funds to pay your taxes, your insurance, maintain that property um, and any additional bills like credit cards and that type of thing. So it's a lot easier to qualify that way. And the same thing with your credit scores, because what I see with reverse mortgage a lot of times is that you'll have uh, maybe a husband and wife, um, and maybe it's usually the person that handles the bills is the one that's going to have the medical problem. So maybe they had a, a point in time where they had some medical problems, um, and it was kind of undetected, but let's call it by the wife. The husband was doing the, uh, the, the, all the bills all the time, never had a problem, and all of a sudden, now... Um, he's not keeping up with things and she doesn't realize it for months later and maybe he's sick. Um, so you can imagine what that does to their credit score. With a reverse mortgage, I'm able to actually explain that and show that, you know, what they've been responsible all this time. And now, you know, they have a set period of time where maybe they've, you know, had some some lates and some uh, maybe credit card lates and things like that that might have affected their score or maybe some medical bills. Um, and I can still do that reverse mortgage. So there's a lot of flexibility with reverse mortgages. And I think the biggest mistake is people always think of it as a loan of last resort. Um, it's absolutely not. And, you know, being 55 now, it used to be that you could only be 62 no matter what. 55 is relatively young for any type of reverse mortgage. And to be able to access a loan where you don't have a mortgage payment and you're able to use that to build an ADU and have um, some cash flow, I think, is amazing. The other thing is that um, you can use now we have a, a second trustee reverse. So same thing we were mentioning, interest rates are great or they've been great, right? So 
people don't want to get rid of their first mortgage. They, they, maybe they could still afford to make that payment. I'm, I actually can offer now a second trustee to reverse mortgage, meaning that you could do a second and um, not make a mortgage payment on that second and still be able to access that cash and keep your, your low interest uh, first is, trustee. Is there a cap on that second amount? I'd say it's still going to be about the same. You do have to have substantial equity. So between the first, your, your first loan and the available second, you're still probably looking at about 50% of the value. Okay. Okay. Um, I had a long presentation. I tried to cover as many bullet points as I could in the form of a story. Did we miss anything? Is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? Um, I would say the line of credit is one of the biggest features of a reverse mortgage. Um, so many people are using it, of course, as a uh, you know, vehicle, let's say, to finance an ADU. But I work with a lot of financial advisors, and they're actually telling their clients that rather than making monthly mortgage payments and just basically having that money locked up in, in that home, um, that home doesn't make mortgage payments to you. It doesn't pay your grocery bills. It does, it's, not, it's not necessarily wise to continue to make mortgage payments into retirement. And reverse mortgage is set up to, um, there's an ability to set up a home equity line of credit basically on a reverse so that at 62, you get rid of your mortgage payment. If you've still got one, you set up a line of credit um, at let's say the 62 mark. And that allows you to actually have a line of credit throughout the life of that home. And the reason why that's a big deal is that we've seen huge market swings up and down. Um, I've been doing reverse mortgages since, um, well, earlier than 2007. So I was doing loans at 2007 and eight values. And then if you think about setting up a line of credit at that value in 2010 and 11, home values could have been conceivably 50% less. Well, with a reverse mortgage, that home equity line of credit is not frozen. It can't be adjusted because of home value. None of that stuff happens with a reverse mortgage. You set up a line of credit, um, it's actually protected so that you still have access to it, even if home values drop. So that's completely unique to um, home equity lines of credit on reverse. And the other part of it is that it actually grows over time. So someone that set up um, a reverse line of credit in 2008, even if their home values drop, that line of credit continues to increase, even if home values don't. So a lot of people think that the growth is um, based on home value or um, or any increase in equity. It's really not. It's based actually on the interest rate. So if you, the interest rate on your reverse is, let's say the effective rate is six and a half percent, that means that if you set up a line of credit now, that line of credit will grow that six and a half percent every single year and it's compounding. Um, it's usually easiest to explain it if you think about the reason for lines of credit as far as let's say FHA because it's typically an FHA loan. FHA um, does most of reverses but they're the ones that still only allow 62. I have some other ones that do offer for 55 but when we're talking about that growing line of credit, the intention is to have access to those funds over a lifetime. Um, so as you get older, let's say you build an ADU, but let's say you know it's, it gets to be pretty expensive um, as you get older, it never gets any cheaper. You're looking at maybe having some help to be able to help you to stay in your home, maybe doing some extra modifications to the home. All of that costs extra money. Well, that line of credit is actually available for that and maybe for anything that you choose. Um, but that's one of the best features I think of that of reverse mortgages. And that's what financial advisors are usually I'm um, pretty excited about is using it to set up a line of credit to be able to finance, let's say, long-term care or some other additional costs that go into, you know, just aging in place. Okay. Well, listen, thank you very much. Uh, I want to say thank you to Karen Moore, uh, Meredith Munger Stowers. Meredith, stick around. You're going to help me with SB9. And Susanna Rhodes, of course, thank you for your time, ladies. It was just wonderful hearing from you. And I hope the uh, the people listening got some out of it. You did post your contact info in the chat screen that they can all click on, right? And I yeah, will mm -hmm. show I will show everybody's uh, marquee one more time. If you want to do a quick uh, screenshot of everybody's contact stuff, I'll get it one more time. And then we're going to talk about SB9 lot split legislation. Let's do it. All right. Um, so uh, moving on now, uh, Karen Moore and Susanna, if you want to stay on, you're welcome to stay on. If you have things to do and you don't want to hear about 
this, you don't have to. I appreciate you, you coming on, and I hope we can have you back again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. I'll be on. All right. All right. So now, one step down. can you zoom on one step so they can see the entire? Step? I sure can. Let me let me just adjust it here. You can click there. Thank you. Right. That's much better because it fits in. The okay. Everybody can see that better. Yep. All right. My IT desk is kind of make make sure that it trims my nails. Okay. <laughs> So, all right, um, so here's the thing. Everybody's asking, 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 how can you lot split? I heard you could do this. I heard you could do that. So Meredith, you have your own presentation on this. So let's talk about this together. I'll tell you, and I have to tell you, and as I write these, uh, I always try to come up with new material for each show for each month. I am learning and I learned quite a bit uh, about this topic. So I wanna, Kind of go through it and let's explain what California says and where it all started from. So SB 9 or Senate Bill 9 was uh, is written by Senator Tony Atkins and she is the author and SB 9 is, uh, is about opening the door for more families to pursue their vision, their version of the California dream. Whether that's building a home for elderly parent or creating new space uh, or source of income or buying that very first house, it's about opportunity. So that was the spirit of why she wrote this bill. Um, now, SB9 uh, is also called an, an urban lot split um, because it's designed to maximize or let's say optimize urban areas. It's not necessarily designed for country living. So they're trying to figure out, and it's also, let me go back to this other one. I forgot to highlight this. It's also called the duplex bill. So what I learned is why do they call it the duplex bill? Because they want to offer homeowners an opportunity to turn your single house into a duplex or two, okay? So that's what the bill was created for. They're trying to create, how can we create product, housing product, in an area that's already built, rather than go outward on the on the fray or the fringe of, of neighborhoods. What about within the neighborhoods that are already built? How can we optimize these things? Well, one of them is allow people to turn their uh, property into a duplex. So in an urban area, not rural, the purpose is to create more housing products where they're needed most, which is in the cities, not the country. It's not applicable in historical districts. So if you live in Old Town, LA, and you have to conform to the, the historical society things and that so forth, you can't really be part of this or if you're in a historically registered neighborhood. HOAs can prohibit SB9. So you need to check with your HOA. If you have an HOA and you're not sure, they'll tell you whether or not you can lot split or not, okay? SB9 units must be at least 800 square feet or larger. SB9 has existing tenant protections, which means if you've got a tenant living in there and they've been in there up to three years, they have rights and they have rent control. So anything that goes against the affordability covenant or rent control, you've got to check because they, you, they, you may be in, infringing on them. For customers that say, hey, I'm thinking about taking my house. I got a monstrous house. Why couldn't I convert part of it into an ADU? You can. Uh, but there's a little old thing called the Ellis Act that says there are limitations on interior walls. So we have to check with each city and say, what does the ordinance say? Uh, what, if you live in, in the city of Orange, for example, what do they say about the Ellis Act and how many walls do you need to have or can you have to take an existing main house and convert it into an, uh, 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 an ADU? Properties with existing a JADUs probably will not qualify for SB9 lot splits. So if you have a junior ADU right now, it's not likely that it'll qualify, but we can always check with the city to be sure. If you are in a fire hazard area, you probably are not going to because it's going to be red flag due to unsafe uh, health and safety conditions, okay? So these things right here we're rattling off. These are the state conditions. Uh, urban lot splits, they have to be larger than 2,400 square feet. So let's visualize this. If I'm going to split the lot 
each lot has to be 24, it has to be 1200 square feet or larger, otherwise you cannot do it, okay? So you can split the lots 50-50 or 60-40, but there's a certain way to do it and I'm going to show you how to do that. If I'm moving through these, you can do screenshots and you can capture the info uh, or we'll send it to you, just sell, uh, we, we're, we're happy to send this to you and then you can have a copy of the PDF. Um, these do have to be owner occupied. So if you have a piece of property and you want to do a lot split, not only does it have to be owner occupied, but you have to sign an affidavit that says, I plan on living here for three years, okay? I plan to live here for three years. If it's 2,400 square feet or larger, and each split can be 1,200 square feet, that's great. You're on your way. The only other thing left is they have to have access to the public right of way, which is the street. So we have to have access to it, okay? Um, SB9 lot splits cannot be done on two adjacently owned properties. If I own a property here and the one very next door, I own both of them, I can do a lot split on one or the other, but not both side by side. You can do one if you own three properties together and you have one on one side and one on the other and something in between that is not going to be lot split, you can do on, you can leapfrog over them and do those, but you cannot do them adjacent to each other. Now, let's take a look at what it's going to look like. So if you have all this criteria, you can add a second unit. So what we have over here is we've got a house and we've got a garage. So what SB9 says is I can put a second unit out there. Okay, so it goes in the back. Um, I can also convert this garage into an ADU. So this dotted line shows parcel number one. This represents parcel number two. This is how it was split, okay? So you can split, there's before and there's after. What we have to remember is there has to be access to the right of way. So we have to make sure that lot number two back there has access to the public road, okay? And they're probably gonna want you to put a driveway in there. What you can then do once you have your lot split, you can have a garage and, or you can have a, a, your main house and an ADU. You can have your second lot, main house on the lot split back here and then an ADU. So technically, we've gone from one unit to four units effectively. This is what the Senate bill and this is why they call it the duplex bill. Okay. Main house, main house, and it's going to look like that. There's the access public right of way. Um, okay, so I just want to kind of run through this real quick. Here's some developments. This is Simi Valley. So they're, they're already, we have a lot of communities that are already doing lot splits. And I picked these up off the internet. Uh, this is Simi Valley. And here's a couple of different variations on how, how they do their, uh, their lot splits. Here's Milpitas in Northern California and Campbell. This is how they do their lot splits. So the point is here's Santa Cruz. So summary, and if you have a property that qualifies for an SB9 uh, project, you can turn one single home into two duplexes. Depending upon the size of your units, it's not unreasonable to collect two to three thousand dollars per unit if you I'm live here, on the property. Uh, here's somebody. If you live on the property, three of these units could now earn between six and eight thousand dollars a year. So this is why so many people are trying to figure this out because it's going to create mailbox money. So we want to do master planning. If you guys have an interest of learning more about it, uh, you can check on our website or you can you can contact me directly. This is my contact information. Uh, I'm the director of sales and customer care. Here's my phone number. I have a tendency to be, uh, to, I am prone to losing my voice because I talk a lot. So if you want to send me an email, here's an email and we can get you, give you some more information on that. If you will put your address in there and maybe a little highlight paragraph of what your condition is and we can uh, communicate by email. I'll even schedule potentially a, uh, a, a, a video call with you and we can get started uh, talking about that. Meredith, where are you at? She's still with me? She's. I don't hear her. She's trying. She's <laughs> trying. Asked, asked to unmute. Did you go to the bar? 
while I was talking? You were supposed to help me. I think maybe you can use her phone number again. Yeah, she's muted on her end. I think you're muted on your end. Start pushing some buttons. Yeah, there we there go. you go. Now you're back. Now you're you back. Guys are kicking me, but... All right. What did I miss? Well, um, okay. So I think, I mean, there's so many things. I think, you know, in a practical matter, so what? here's what I'm seeing. The UC Berkeley Turner Center said there's been like nine SB9, uh, you know, stuff done. And so it's totally the Wild West. Now, I have clients that have done two of the four SB9 units in LA. So the cool part about LA is they really want housing. And so they're willing to do SB9 units. And why are they willing to do it? Because if you, in theory, and I, I put this in the chat, if you Google search HCD SB9 handbook, that is the plain language state law of what can be done. Now, what it doesn't say is really the law is supposed to be for owner occupied, but city of LA doesn't care. So I had a client who had built an ADU. They, within a month, had it converted to an SB9 unit because the city knows they want to develop two additional ADUs. By state law, at the very least, owner-occupied properties can have one, uh, build one extra house, which we know is an SB9 unit, and two ADUs. And if you want to build two, if you want to build more, at that point, you probably want to split the lot and so on. The only reason why you want to go to the trouble of splitting the lot, because it's a huge pain and it costs money, um, is if you want to sell off the lot or you want to build additional units. But what's most pertinent about this for everybody is you want to master plan your property. You might only want to build one ADU today, and that's fine. But don't slap it in the middle of your backyard. Put it in a back corner, because if you like it, and you're getting ready for retirement and you want to or you want to expand that house for your kids or whatever then you you have the space and master planning to be able to expand that unit and build additional space that's right. the main key now the other thing is i think we spoke about this there's also conditional financing if we call it an adu that's going back there There's going to be certain underwriting things for the loan, but if we say it's going to be something completely different, like an ADU, uh, like a a SB9 unit, there's other considerations when it comes to lending. Is it not? Is that not true? Oh my gosh, the lending guidelines so don't match the permit guidelines, which is why we do this collaboration upfront before you spend a dime. So bizarrely, in all of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's guidelines. There is no reference to ADU up until two weeks ago when we asked, can we use a construction loan, not equity, but construction loan to build an SB9 unit? And they said, uh, we don't know, uh, no. So the answer to that is we do multi-phase construction. And if you have equity, if you're just doing a HELOC or you're just doing a cash out refinance, you can build whatever the heck you want. Once it's built, we should have no trouble at all. But sometimes we have to do a phased approach. So phase one, we typically do a garage conversion, not as a junior ADU, but as a quote unquote room addition, right? I don't want to see anything about JADU nonsense. By mortgage financing laws, I'm only allowed to have one ADU on the property. So we build this huge unit ADU in the back. It's officially zoned as an ADU in phase one, and we do a room (coughs) addition on the attached garage. Then when my appraiser goes home, we get certificate of occupancy, which means my loan people go home. Then you can do phase two, which is you go back, you can, you resubmit permits on that room addition. It's now a junior ADU, which should get you about at least $22 to $2,500 a month in rent. Now, that big old back unit, let's say you did a two-bedroom, two-bath. Now, you're going to split it in half. You just wall in the little hallway, throw in a kitchenette, and lo and behold, you have a one-bedroom on one side and a one-bedroom on the other side, each of them renting for $2,500 and $2,500, right? Yeah, it's And cool. one of them will be rezoned as an, an SB9 unit, and one of them will be rezoned as an ADU. They might look and feel exactly the same, 
who cares? It doesn't matter. It's all about what you're zoning them as. So where there's a will, there's a way. And this is where ADU expertise really, really matters in getting stuff done. Great, great. Vic, how are we doing on time? And how are we going to get to some of these questions? We got a lot of questions in there. We can, we can open up. This. You all want right. to stop sharing your screen. That way we'll be a little bit more zoomed Absolutely. In. Let's move on. So let's see, um, I know Meredith, she's always answering questions. She may have answered all of them. Who knows? We don't, don't know. <laughs> let's see, okay. Um, oh, somebody asked if they, we can get them a copy of the recording. Yeah, we can. Yep, okay, yes, we can. Uh, too bad we don't seem too professional. Need to keep with professional people. <laughs> well, I think well, we got Rocky start. I apologize about that. You're 100 percent right. We'll take we'll fall on the sword. We'll fall on the sword with that. Uh, let's see. I'd love for someone to reach out uh, to me. And after the call, we're about to start a project. This is Audra Lorenzo. Um, Audra, I don't know. Did we put the appointment calendar in there, yeah. Vic? Yeah, I'll so, put it again. Now. So uh, I think somebody already typed, I see your name. Uh, we have an appointment calendar address. So if you'd like to speak to somebody, just click on it or you can, you know, you can always email me or call me as well. If my voice is bad, I may take the email before the call though, but, or you can click on this appointment calendar. We're happy to speak to you. Uh, can a HELOC loan uh, be asked it to be paid in full at any, at any time by the bank or lender? Meredith? Yeah, there is no prepayment penalty on home equity lines of credit or home equity loans. And in fact, when you do the math on the rental income, if you take all the rental income, you can typically pay them off in five to seven years, and then you can work on paying off the rest of your mortgage. And then it's just pure cash flow. It's amazing. The other question was, um, I see, is there a list of banks or financial institutions that are, are, are lenders for ADUs? I don't know if there's a specific list. Do you think, uh, Meredith? No, I can tell you we are the largest ADU lender in the state. And I think what's most important is here, a lot of folks will go to their local credit union or big banks. A lot of people don't know Bank of America and Wells Fargo aren't even doing mortgages anymore. And ironically, they have delegated their mortgages to top banks like us. Like they trust us to do their loans for them. They're not even doing them in-house. So you want somebody who knows what they're doing because otherwise you're going to come up with your scenario. The easy way to tell you is, oh, you're not qualified rather than saying, we don't have the loan for you. Okay. Wayne Aldridge, you said, I, if I'm going to live in the ADU and rent out the main house, would that still qualify for the owner occupied? Yeah, I believe it does, doesn't it? It sure does. You have to live somewhere on the property. I don't even care if you're living in an RV. If you live on the property, it's yeah. owner occupied. Okay. Our Trillion Services just offered in California. I think um, Karen answered that question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, would you guys okay. share this PowerPoint? Yes, we will. Um, let's see. Tell you what we're going to wind up doing. We have more. Every time we do this, we have more. We have more customers log in than we do. Um, our customer. If I didn't say this earlier, typically after the day after the webinar, we have an all hands on deck. Uh, my customer care team and I. We will meet here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And we're going to try our best to call everybody on the registration list. So if you're on this call tonight, you we have your contact information. And if you're working, that means we'll probably miss you. We'll try you back. But if you're home and we didn't get a chance to talk to you or answer any of your questions, don't panic. Write them down, and uh, we'll talk to uh, we'll talk to you about anything you want to talk about, whether it's just generic knowledge or maybe something specific regarding your project. We'll be calling between nine and twelve. We'll try our best to get to everybody. If we missed you, then send us an email, send me an email, and I'll address it personally. Um, Giovanni, you know, huh? Danny, can I, can I address the grant? Um, because that's kind of a little bit of an elephant in the room on this one. And as, as somebody who financed 90% of last year's grants, I'm telling you, don't do it. You don't want this grant. I have a lot of unhappy clients. Um, so the rules have changed and what happens is you're required to put a hundred percent 
of the construction budget into an escrow account, which means you start paying on the loan from day one. Well, that alone pretty much wipes out any benefit of the grant. It's also taxable not to the amount you use, but the 40000 which wipes out another third of the grant. And there's tons of restrictions. There were only 150 slots available today, and that was from all the fallout in 2022. And quite honestly, in December, behind the scenes, when the doors were officially closed, we were filling slots. That's how much fallout happened in 2022. There are changes afoot. We'll let you know when there is, but I'm telling you, you don't want, I'll help you if you really are obsessed with this, but I'm telling you, you don't want it. You know, that's kind of a, that's kind of a weird statement. We, we probably should clarify because if, if there's anybody on this webinar that doesn't know what we're talking about, that's going to sound strange. So I'll just offer this. California had a $40,000 grant and anything that is affordable housing or maybe something that could contribute to the solution of homeless is at the top of Governor Newsom's list. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to have a grant that rewarded people like everybody on the webinar. If you build a house, we want to kick in and give you a, um, a grant that is forgivable, which means you don't have to pay it back. Now, on the surface, well, that sounds wonderful, but the only problem that we discovered was that the rollout from California was dubious, and I'm being polite. It was downright sloppy. So what happened is the administrators, like CCAD, CCEDA, yeah, CCEDA and HPP Cares were the admins of these um, uh, grants, and I feel bad for them because they were stuck in the middle of a bad, bad uh, deal, and there was no direction or clarification. And I almost feel even worse for the customers. I have a customer, a couple of customers on this webinar that I can see you right now. I know who you are, and you waited months and months and months, and it was a frustrating deal. And only now we're getting through it. So I guess what Meredith was talking about, it was a it was a bumpy ride. It was a bumpy ride. And the grant is officially over as of 2022. I don't think they're going to do another rollout on 2023. Uh, they gave away a lot of money. And I think they're done. The money that was scheduled to be um, used for 2023 was pulled. And it's going to something equally as important. But I don't think it's coming back. So if you're thinking on waiting for the next train, don't because the train may not come. Yeah. And if the train came, I don't think you'd like to ride. It was a rough one for us. We we had it right in the middle of the holidays. And if I could turn back time, I'd get rid of the grant. So I'm I'm happy for all of the, all of you that got it. And I'm happy that it's not coming back. Okay, so let's get back to our. Uh, questions here. Uh, let's see. Property taxes. How much does a $200,000 ADU in San Gabriel Valley increase our property taxes, Meredith? Yeah, so you can call anybody here can call your local county tax assessor. And here's what they'll tell you. Your primary home, your existing home and all of the land remain at the same. So your, your existing stuff does not change. When you build um, the ADU, the, the certificate of occupancy, not the financing, the certificate of occupancy um, notifies the tax assessor to come out and check it. And they will tell you to calculate 1% times the construction budget and then divide it by 12 for your monthly payment. I don't usually see that. I usually see 100 to 150 bucks because just like your current tax assessor, like they're not looking at Zillow to see your current value. Your current tax basis is like, it's way, way lower. Um, and similarly with homeowner's insurance, um, you know, usually I see if you add tack it on to your existing homeowner's insurance, it's about 20 bucks a month. So if you have a member of the family who really wants to quote unquote own their ADU, You'll see that pretty clearly, that distinguishment between the old stuff and the new stuff on the property tax bill and junior or grandma, whoever owns the ADU, can pay that portion. Right. Great. Next question is, how long does the whole process usually last in Orange County for an ADU to be completed and rentable? 
Mike C, what do you think? What do you think? How long does a whole process usually last? Design, plans, permits, construction, then renter moves in. Uh, generally, well, it differs from county to county, city to city. Uh, what we typically see is permitting times around six months, and some of them are upwards of nine months. Uh, construction times, we typically see those around four to six months. So right. Uh, right. we're looking at a complete project in somewhere around a year to a, a year and six months tops, a year and three months. San Diego is a little longer than everybody else, but we've had a, a, a pretty good luck lately with L.A. County or L.A. City than, than L.A. County, right? Yeah, L.A. City is getting a lot faster. Uh, we're getting them three, four months at this point. We have uh, Mayor Bass hot on the trail. She swears she's going to approve plans in two months. God bless her. I hope she does because then everything will be great. L.A. City is lightning fast because they we use a digital portal. L.A. County is dreadful. They're slow. So uh, L.A. County, Orange County, San Diego County, a little slower. L.A. City, lightning fast. We got a... Uh... A set of plans approved in three weeks in LA City. LA City. I don't know if it was a coincidence with Mayor Bass, but we did get that done. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm hopeful and anxious that it can get get better because if LA City sets the bar for 2023, I think other counties and cities will follow. So, okay, how how does the lender make money on a reverse mortgage? I don't know. Susanna, are you still with us? Still I see. With us. I see you. Yes, I sure am. All right, you want to tackle yeah. that one? Sure, absolutely. Um, it, it sounds too good to be true. It's it's not, but just remember lenders are in, of course, the business to make money. There is interest that is charged or accrued on a reverse mortgage. There's no monthly payment required at all, to be clear. So you're not making that monthly payment, but the interest is adding up on the loan balance. So whatever you borrow, the amount, um, whatever that loan balance is, is accruing interest. And, and when the bank actually gets paid back is when that home is sold, refinanced, or the, the homeowners no longer live in the property. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're catching up, please. Okay, typically you see, okay, so man, you guys are fast. You guys are, these, these gals have been answering all these questions. Will we have access to the recording in PowerPoint? Yes, we will. Uh, there's interest accrued. Um, there is interest which is accrued. Oh, is that a question or is that an answer? It looks like it was an answer. Sorry about that. Does anybody know uh, any successful attached garage ADU conversion in CID with an HOA? What is a CID? Is that? That was from Gary Penn. Gary, are you are you, are you there? What's a CID? Um, it's probably going to be a stupid, a simple answer. I'm going to feel dumb. I don't know what a CID is. Uh, any conversion in the CID with HOA? Um, bottom, that, line, bottom line is HOAs cannot block you. In fact, there that is part of state law that they have 60 days to approve you. They cannot subjectively change anything. The only thing they can do is make you abide by the presentation standards um, of the area. So for example, if all the homes in your HOA are stuccoed, you gotta use the same stucco, you gotta use the same paint colors, but that's it. Okay, um, next question. This presentation will be posted on YouTube. Yeah, it takes a couple of days for YouTube to screen the video and make sure that they, they like it and then they'll post it and we'll have it available. And everybody that's on this registration will get an email and we'll send it to you if you want. I think the best way to, to gain the, the PowerPoints and review what was on this presentation is to schedule with, uh, there's a link in the, in the uh, chat, schedule with one of us and we'll be talking with you directly. And we can even go over the PowerPoint over a video call in detail with you directly. Yeah, sometimes this stuff, Sometimes be careful what you ask for because you could get it. If I send you what we did, you may still need a guide or you may want a guide. So you may want a, uh, some, one of us to kind of walk you through what you're looking at. Otherwise, you'll get some of it, but not all of it. And then it's uh, sort of rendered ineffective. Um, so um, click here to uh, schedule a free feasibility. So that is posted in on the web chat. If property is in Los Angeles, how does the rent stabilization program affect the property? So it's my understanding that single family residents are void from the typical rent laws 
Meredith and Susanna and Karen, you may have an opinion on this, but I think they're for apartments, uh, uh, but not single family residents as far as some of the rent control. Are, are, did you hear the same thing? Yeah, if it's owner occupied property and you have ADUs on there, um, the renters are not subject to rent control or to um, any other state or national rental rules. Right, right. So it means that if you decide you want to charge what you want to charge, if you live in an apartment, for example, I think if you live in an apartment, you're not allowed to raise the rent more than $100 per year, but it doesn't apply to single family uh, residences or ADUs. So um, I think what we should probably say is a disclaimer, uh, we're not attorneys, but I check with your city ordinances, but I'm pretty sure that's universal. Uh, when it comes to single property. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, let's see, I missed a portion of the video. Can I get a copy? Yes, we are gonna get that to you as soon as we get it approved by YouTube. Uh, setting up. Uh, can you all help with setting up a trust? If somebody says they want to set up a trust, I think we can. I think uh, um, Susanna already answered that. Uh, the $40,000 grant, we went through that. The grant is no longer available. We got that. Is it correct that if you add 150 square foot area for an e ingress or egress to an existing unit to make a junior ADU? So Gary, that's another question for Gary. So I think if we need to uh, make sure that, you know, the, uh, the criteria for junior is up to a maximum of 500 square feet total, but you cannot extend the exterior of the house uh, beyond 150 square feet. That means we're going to have to commandeer 350 inside and then 150 outside to stay within that 500. So you can uh, um, extend it outwards a maximum of 150. If you need more than that, we've got to commandeer it from the inside up to no more than 500, uh, 350 for a grand total of 500. Okay, and that 150 is, you're correct, only for ingress, egress. Right. Uh, I already have two properties on my lot. Can I build an ADU on one of the properties in the backyard? Meredith, I think we're good to go on that. Heck yeah, if it's owner-occupied. And part of that is working, again, with ADU professionals, because one of the things I see, and I am neutral, I do not get referral fees from these guys. I don't give referral fees. I am Switzerland. But I will tell you, these guys are the fastest permitters in the West, and it helps to have that kind of rapport. Um, Esther, I saw you have 18 months waiting for permits in the San Fernando Valley. That's outrageous. That is, I'm, I'm so sorry for you. But that is exactly the kind of nonsense I see with, when you don't have an ADU pro um, on the line. So these guys know, I'll be honest with you, I've worked with these guys for four years. They know what they're doing. Um, hey, Danny, I wanted to switch the topic though. Somebody was asking if manu you manufactured homes count as ADUs. Aren't you guys official suppliers of Boxable and some other really cool prefabs? Oh, sh no, we're, no. We're, we're, we're partners with Boxable, yes. Now, here's the thing. Um, we don't have a single thing against prefab. We don't. We think we're great. No. They're fantastic. And we've even been approached. You know, I think we're approaching, I think we're slowly going to become, if we're not already, the largest ADU contractor designer company in California. And so we've been approached by manufacturers to white label product. And it's still there. It's on the table. We're partners with Boxable and we've even went to Nevada and walked the plant, right? Yeah. Um, all of that's all true. It's all true. And, but the funny thing about it is, is that we, our product, Boxable, Prefab, they all have their own characteristics and personality. And at the end of the day, we look at what is the cost? What is the convenience of, of, of customizing? I'm not going to throw rocks at prefab or boxable because they're the, some of the people on this this webinar are friends of ours that are working in that that market. But I've always said that when the day comes when we lose market share because we don't offer prefab, we're absolutely going to take these people up on it. We're going to white label something. We're going to build it in our name, and it's going to say ADU Resource Center, and there we're going to be dropping these things on the ground 
like mushrooms, we'll do it. But every time we have a consultation with a client, they said, look, can we add this? Can we customize that? Can we change the windows? Can we add windows? Can we do this? Can we do that? Sure, you can do that. I don't know that you have that, of that convenience on prefab because they're built off site and they're going to give you, I believe, maybe three different variations, but you cannot alter windows. You can't do some of the things that we do in custom building. So at the end of the day, I think that our product is a great value and we just haven't lost enough market share yet to say we need to join the club or we need to bring on our own white label. Right, guys? Right. And, um, you know, a lot of these uh, prefab companies, they have a set price. You go on their website, $50,000, $60,000 per unit. But when it's all said and done, you still need to go through the city. You need a foundation, you need utility connections. It ends up costing the same as stick build a lot of times even more. And unfortunately, a lot of times they don't appraise the same way a stick build uh, usually does. So I would say a stick build yeah. unit is the wiser direction to go. But, you know, the prefab units have their own benefits. If, for example, yeah. Uh, they'll be on your site much, much less. We, we're probably there three to five months. They're going to be on site maybe two months, one I, month. I had a client. I had a client that was going to do a prefab, good size one, 1,200 square feet. And I had two clients that says, you know, I can't do it because I can't, uh, my property, I have power lines in Los Angeles and the cranes are not allowed to go over the power line. So that threw that customer out. We got them. And then um, the other customer says, I found out what my cream fee will be, and it was going to be $65,000. So I thought I was saving money, and it turned out that now I'm more expensive than ADU resource custom build. So again, I'm not throwing, we're not ne making negative comparisons. You know, they have a, it, it's a fabulous, fabulous product. If we ever feel like we're losing market share, we will white label one of our own, but we just haven't. We've got 300 projects plus now in, in Southern California in various stages of permit planning and construction. And we just, I, I don't feel like we're missing anything. So it's just not our cup of tea because we like to customize. When you say, can I change this? Can I edit it? Can I add this? We want to say, yes, we want you to grow the product. We want yeah. you to get the product. I don't think you have to cover anything. There's a reason why 99.9% .9 of ADUs are stick built. And quite honestly, the HUD manufactured homes are far more expensive than a stick build. They just are. They're great. It's wonderful. Um, but stick build is just generally whatever. It is. And they're tried and true yeah. and it's a proven commodity. We know what they're going to appraise for. There's no wonder or guess. Okay. So next question. I already have two. I got that. We already got that. Can I just uh, say something before we get to the questions? Yeah. I know people are, it's, it's been a long, uh, long event and people are kind of getting tired. I see some of you dropping out. I just want to make sure you guys know we do offer a free on site consultation. So if you guys want an expert to come on site, meet with you guys, look at your property, make sure there's no obstacles like easement trees or power poles that can come in the way. Once we leave the site, you'll have a really good idea of the timeline, the process and the cost to build an ADU, you'll have a really, you'll, you'll be able to make the right decision once we leave. We also offer uh, video calls where we can put your property on the screen and almost do a very similar uh, process where we go over all the details of your specific property. And uh, once we're done with that meeting, you'll have a pretty good idea again if, if this is something you want right. to do. How are we doing on time, Vic? Well, we're good. I mean, we can just continue with the questions. And okay. Um, we got a question from iPhone. Okay. Mr. iPhone, he has property taxes uh, and property adjustment is what it concerns me. I'm currently paying $11,000 per year now. Uh, bought the house six months ago for $800,000. So I'm not sure. I think what maybe you're asking is if you build an ADU, is your property taxes going to go up? Yes, but only on the improvements, only on the ADU, your current grandfathered, uh, your main house is grandfathered in. Not that that's a great property tax. It's a good house and that's $880,000 and it's assessed at that number. That's why you're paying $11,000. But your property tax is gonna go up in a marginal amount on an ADU, not quite to the tune what you're, ex you're expecting. So the main house doesn't get reappraised. It does not, it stays the same. Um, a lot of these questions have been asked. Uh, I will schedule a call with you. I will find out what my parents found out. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, okay. Uh, a lot of you guys. 
do you guys come to my property to see if I could build an ADU? Robert, yes, we do. We're happy to do so. If you want to schedule an on-site, we're happy to do it. It's free, doesn't cost you a dime. If you want to schedule a Google video call, we can even do it that way, that way. So lately we've been doing a lot of them because of the rain. It's been so rainy. I was in uh, Colton over the, uh, over the weekend. It actually snowed, if you can believe that. So the video calls sometimes will work if the weather won't cooperate. Um, what is the cost of electrical and water meter in the city of Lakewood? So let's be clear. If you're building an ADU and you want to do a private meter for the electrical for an ADU on the house, um, it's not as expensive as you might think. It could be between six and eight thousand dollars, depending upon what you want to do and what do you uh, what city you live in. On the other hand, a water main is very expensive. So let's be clear, crystal clear, and this this comes from Manuel. So Manuel, I want to maybe try to talk you out of that separate water main. That's that big meter at the curb. Um, the city is going to put the price on that and I've seen them be very, very expensive. What we'd prefer to do maybe is give you a free inline water pump that is connected to the water line going to the ADU and it'll show the gallons used each month. Uh, that's free. It costs it costs you nothing because we're going to do that on on every ADU anyway. I think the the the, the meter itself is a three hundred dollars thing you can get at Home Depot or Lowe's. But I've seen these dedicated water mains just for the ADU up to twenty twenty thousand dollars or more. I'm just not a big fan of it. That's my fifty cent opinion. But I just don't think they pay for themselves over time. I I I, I understand the electrical part of it. I just don't see spending that much for a dedicated water meter at the curb. What do you think, Mike? Uh, you know what? There, most people that ask that question are thinking of it from a, I'm going to have a tenant and I want them to pay their independent bills. There's right. a better solution. So you can have your own privately owned meter, and that's what we're talking about here. And that will, uh, there are third-party services that will generate a bill for you. So the bill comes in to this third-party service they will monitor the difference between the main house and the ADU's usage and will send both you, uh, the main house, and the ADU their own bills. You'll pay the bills to that company and they turn around and pay the bill to the utility. That is a very inexpensive process, very, very inexpensive process in comparison to you going out and going from the utility and having a new meter put in. Um, that also, that's not just for water, that applies to your gas and your electrical if you wanna bypass putting in an uh, extra panel. Uh, electrical panels aren't that expensive. It's usually the gas and the water ones that'll get you for a fat price. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Rosacella Lopez. She wants to know if we get approved for a loan, can we use a private contractor or does it have to be a contractor you work with? Well, here's the thing. If you already have your plans and permit, you can obviously go anywhere you want. If you don't have your plans, engineering and permit, we can assist you with that. And then you can still go to any contractor you want. So I don't think it really matters. I just don't know what you've got done already. If you have nothing done, then you may want to start with us and have us maybe figure out your plans in your engineering and scope of work so that it can be done. Uh, that has to be done accurately. And then from there, it's your choice. We do have incentive programs that if you stay with us, there's a financial incentive to stay with us and use our contractor. We have uh, three internal contractors right now and 21 network partners uh, that, we, that we work with. So, I mean, it's almost 25 contractors in Southern California that we've already vetted. We've vetted maybe 80 contractors to find out what the reviews are, their building materials what's their customer satisfaction and what their product looks like. And not all of them made it. I mean, 20 out of 80, that's not a very good thing. So there's a lot of contractors out there that I don't know that if they didn't pass our test, they might not pass your test. So we triple vetted ours already. And if you want to find out what the, the bid would be, I mean, that's part of our service. We're going to shop your project ag aggressively, either internally or with our network partners, because I mean, with, the 300 plus projects that we have right now, 
we're going to be coming into spring real soon. And so we're going to be in peak season in full stride. And there may be come a time when we're bottlenecked. We need some helping hands. That's why we've done our vetting ahead of time. We prefer all the work be done with our internal sources first. And the overflow goes out to our, our partners that we vetted. But again, just to clarify your question, um, Rosie Asella, no, you don't have to go through us. But I'll make a voodoo doll and mm -hmm. I'll pinch it. I'll stick a pin in the back of it and you'll have chronic back pain for the rest of your life. If you don't, I'm teasing. You can go whoever you want. Um, you may use a contractor. Look at Meredith. She's answering everything for me. It makes my job easier. It saves my voice. Um, can a manufactured home be built to count as an ADU? Um, I don't know that it cannot. I mean, it's prefab, right? So a prefab's prefab. So I think manufacturer's prefab. So I would say the answer is probably yes. Yes. Um, what happens if the reverse mortgage interest exceeds the value of the home? Is uh, Su uh, Susanna, She's you're on. still here? Did she answer that one already? Let me see. Maybe she I did. It's on there. She already answered it. Okay. But I'm here. So Wayne got his question. Okay. Do you guys give free estimates on ADUs? Yes, of course we do. <clears throat> uh, I want an ADU that is senior friendly i.e. wheelchair accessibility, no steps, wide doorways, electric appliances, et cetera. I would like to interview an architect who can show me ideas for this. Uh, hard money for Karen, does client uh, asset include uh, IRA assets? I think it does, doesn't it, Karen? I think she's still here. We don't, ask, we don't use client assets at all. So they don't need to give us any of that. <laughs> So that got, that got even easier. That part, that it's the asset that you're wanting to have a project with. That's what we're using. All right. So, that's, so, that's the first question so John, the, the question about the um, senior friendly, there is a thing called ADA, which is the uh, so American Associ Disability Association, which means there has to be a five foot circumference that they can turn around. So if you have a wheelchair or a walker, you've got to be able to get, uh, 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 get around safely. So yeah, it's just that we want to design something that we, we would call ADA. ADA friendly just simply means exactly what your question was, all that stuff. And we already have floor plan templates, which we can show you that are ADA compliant? So the answer to that is yes, because we have a lot of that. I wanna add something to that. Uh, because we're designing this brand new, those ADA compliant accessories that we need to put in there and things that we need to do to design it so it makes it easy to maneuver around, uh, we can design with very beautiful options. Uh, for instance, we can do a curbless shower, which will look gorgeous and it won't look like you're living in a hospital. A lot of the aftermarket stuff looks like that. So if we can put in something that looks great, that's just going to make you want to use it even more. And it will have future value uh, afterwards. So the the next person that moves in doesn't it doesn't look like uh, it doesn't it doesn't look like a handicap. Right. Yeah. Yep. Next question is from Artin, the city of Burbank. What is the time frame from plan submission to permit being issued? You know, obviously, you know, Glendale, we're based out of Glendale, our, the city right next to us is Burbank. So we have a lot of customers in Burbank. So I think one of the things that I think could be a coincidence, maybe it's a coincidence, I don't know, maybe it's not, but I think our our files are, are getting recognized down there. So I think as we get a relationship going with them, simply by virtue of volume, I think the process could speed up because our work is clean. And so I, I want to mention that there, when it comes to plans and permits, if you want to fast track your project, that is not the part you want to go nickel and diming and trying to find the best deal in town because of the plans and permits are not right. If they're edgy or they're done because somebody said they could do them for near nothing, they can but it doesn't mean that they're going to get through the city and then they're going to get kicked back again and again and again. So if somebody says, I found somebody that could do it for less. Yeah, no doubt. There's, there's always somebody could do it for less, but do you want it? How do you want it? Do you want it done now or do you want it done right? So if you're going to get it for less, you're going to get less. If you're going to pay more, you're likely to get more. So 
the plans and permit and the engineering are not the thing you want to go nickel and diming with. That's what you want perfect. Otherwise, your, your, your episode with the city is going to be terrible, including the county. Okay. So that's all I want to put I'll up. Just answer this question. Burbank takes about five, six months. About five, six months. All right. Francisco Martinez wants to know, there's a restroom built in my garage already. Do I have to tear it down and start all over? So the short answer is if it's an unpermitted room, and let's just say you've got drywall insulation and stuff and a bathroom up there, and you've decided, I want to convert this into a legal ADU. In its current form, if it's unpermitted, you don't get credit for that square footage. So let's say it's a typical two-car garage, 20 feet by 20 feet. That's 400 square feet that you're not getting credit for. I would want to get credit for that because my house is worth a lot of money. And that extra 400 means it's going to be worth a lot of money. But if it's not permitted, the answer is no. So is it worth it to you, Francisco, to take the drywall down and the insulation and take it down to the frame, have a city inspector say, okay, it looks like it was built 16 inches on center. I like the plumbing. I like the electrical. Put it back together and start your ADU. It might be worth it for you because in the end, you're going to have a legal permitted structure that you get credit on the square footage, which you don't have now. So I hope that answers your question. Um, let's see. What is the current estimate price per square foot and what's the price in uh, for an existing unit to remodel? So let's talk about Orange County first because San Diego is more. But Orange County, most of the contractors that we're seeing that we're doing business with are between $250 and $300 per square foot. If you are in a high-line neighborhood, Beverly Hills, Malibu, Calabasas, your life, or Pacific Palisades, yours, your pricing may be more because it's going to be uh, built for that neighborhood. So if... Uh, that explains LA. Let's talk about Orange County. Orange County is pretty much priced the same as LA. Uh, San Diego is a little bit higher. I think San Diego, most of the projects are between three and $400 per square foot. It's just, it is what it is. So the only way to justify it is this. If you were going to build, let's say a thousand square foot ADU, pick your neighborhood. Let's call it your neighborhood. What would have finished thousand square foot, two bedroom house cost. It's going to cost a lot more than it's going to take you to build it. Building it is still cheaper than buying it if it's finished. It could be three times cheaper depending upon what city. It's at least half of cheaper of buying one. So the good news is, depending upon the city you live in, if you factor that it's going to cost whatever it costs, because that's the neighborhood and zip code you live in, for every dollar you throw at this ADU, you're probably going to get three back when it's done. So that's not a bad day. So um, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but that's a pretty good formula and that's a good frame of mind. Yeah, and it's sometimes hard to say because it has to do with how far we're trenching. Do you want height? raised ceilings? Do you want sliding doors? Is this uh, basic finishes? Or yeah. High line finishes? There's so many, so many variables. You and, have the to and the scope of work, of course, you know, if you're, if you're on a side hill and it's going to involve uh, creative engineering because of the, the engineering for your footings, come on, you know, that's going to be a little bit more. So that's why there's really no set formula because it has to do with your property and what your expectations are. Are you going to go basic, middle of the road, or high line finishes? F finishes are anything that we can see with our eyes. So it's going to be the countertops, cabinets, flooring, fixtures, lighting, and all that stuff. We don't know. Are you going to have a, a traditional eight-foot ceiling flat, or is it going to be vaulted, or is it going to be raised 10 feet? Don't know. All of those things have to be factored in. So I'm sorry that I can't give you a cookie-cutter formula, but we build custom houses. The, make no mistake, this is not a Home Depot shed that we're going to be building for you. It's a custom house, and it's an extension of your main property, and it's going to look exactly like your main property. So it's kind of a it's kind of a difficult answer. But if you'll contact us and give us a little bit, of, you know, fill in a couple of blanks, then we can tell you exactly what you can expect. Right now, I'm I'm nervous about giving a generic formula because that would be a blanket statement, and then. They'll all have to deal with that. Yeah, you said on the webinar it was going to be this. Uh, so just, just call us or contact us, and we'll be happy to give you a, a more comprehensive answer. But I got to ask you a couple questions to know more. That's all. 
All right. Um, will the new ADU still come with the gas line? Okay, Armando, it can, but we're seeing trends. So the new building and construction trends are going forward with California's green state, their energy bill, and all gas is not going to be going forward on new construction. Now, we're a green state, and uh, Governor Newsom doesn't like that stinky, smelly, dirty natural gas. So moving forward, uh, we're going to sustainable energy, LED lighting, solar, and things of that nature. Now, if you say, I want my gas, that's fine. We, gotta we still got to dig a dedicated gas line trench back there. But if you're wanting a statistic, 95% uh, of our clients are going all electric. So you can get gas if you want it. Uh, how is pricing estimated? I think we just answered that. Can we Airbnb our ADU? So the short answer is no. And the reason why is they need long-term rentals, not short-term. Short-term rentals will pay you three times what a long-term rental will be. Remember, what is the point of lifting the ordinances and California coming up with affordable housing solutions like SB9, which are designed to let homeowners build and optimize their property. It's not necessarily so you can get rich, but you're going to anyway. But what they want is they want specific things. They want to control, they want long-term rentals for homeowners and they want people to find more product, more affordable housing, not vacation rentals. That wasn't the spirit of what it was for. Okay. I think it's 30 day rentals, right? Minimum of 30 days. 30, 30 days. days, 30 days, right? Okay. Um, do you know the name of the company offhand? I think that's a different question. I don't know what that is. Somebody tried to answer that. Okay. It, Solar panels. Solar panels required on standalone ADUs. I also want to add solar on my main house. Is it better to share a meter? So, all ground up construction in California, it requires a solar system. Again, we're going back to this sustainable energy and solar. It's not going away. Solar is not going away, nor is electric cars, are they? They're here to stay. So I think what we need to figure out is if you're going to build something from the ground up, you're gonna need to require solar. So then the fork in the road is, if I'm gonna put solar on the ADU, why wouldn't I put it on the main house too? So we are connected with a company called Power Solar. We're also uh, affiliated with Sunrun Solar and Tesla Solar. Uh, we have our opinions about them, but if you want a free quote on solar over the phone, all we need is a copy of your recent utility bill showing the kilowatt use, and we can have that for you right away. And it's probably something that we're all gonna do down the road. It's just when we do it, not if we do it. We're all probably gonna do it sooner or later, okay? Um, is it better to share the same meter? I believe it is. If you're going to have, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly, have a solar system big enough that can run both. I think that's probably smart. Uh, Shimita says, I have a junior ADU plan with the city of Irvine and an HOA since November of 2020, still not approved yet. Hopefully soon it will be done. Can I send you a plan to get an estimate? Yes, um, you can send it. Um, I'm curious if you're, I wonder what the holdup is. Is it with the HOA or is it with the city of Irvine itself? Um, maybe if um, I'll show you my email a little bit later, maybe send me an email and then let me do a little detective work and see what we can find out for that for you on that. But yes, if you need a construction loan, by the way, if anybody on this webinar is already in the middle of a, pro a project, we will start a project or we'll finish one or we'll do the whole thing. So if you don't have plans, we'll help you get plans. If you don't have engineering, we'll help you with that. If you have a cocktail napkin and it has a little cartoon on it and you wanna know, can we turn that into something? Yes, we can. If you have plans and you say, well, I haven't really uh, retained a contractor. Can I do a, con can I retain that through you guys? Yes, of course. So we'll, we'll hop on the horse halfway through or we'll get off halfway through the ride and we'll ride with you into the sunset all the way from beginning to end. It's entirely up to you. 
Um, I would, let's see, what's the next one? Uh, does the, okay, this is from Emram. Does third party utility company have the power to cut off utilities? If a tenant from hell doesn't pay rent and you're paying utilities, as a landlord, you cannot cut off utilities. It's illegal. I speak from experience. How does third party handle non-payment? I don't think I'm going to answer that That's one. Question for I don't think I, I don't know that I want to even go there because I don't want to be responsible if I guess wrong because I'm purely going to guess. We actually have an attorney friend uh, that can do us favors. A lot of time it doesn't cost anything to ask these type of questions. So if you guys reach out to us, we can probably uh, find out for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my guess though is the the that question is best apply to the companies that do the third party billing. Uh, they'll have that answer for you. Yeah, I mean, all in all seriousness, we 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 have legal counsel. If you if you really are serious about that question, you want to know more, um, contact us, and maybe we can put you in touch with somebody who has the right answer. We're teasing, of course, but uh, it's it's a it's an important question. I'm not making light of it, but. I'm a little I'm I'm a little nervous about giving you my 50 cent because I have an opinion on that. I just don't think I want to say it. Not okay, online. Danny, I think maybe last question. Okay, one more. Uh, let me pick a good one. Ah, what is the next, Claudina? What is the next step after loan approval? So your your loan approval basically says you can you can pretty much go forward with it. So I think that what you need to do is decide when is your completion date? What is your target for completion? In other words, if we know it's going to be six, seven months, maybe for planning, and then maybe another three or four, maybe five months, if it's a big project, let's just call it a year. It's a year. So, so if we started in March, since today's March 1st, Let's just say your project's not likely to be done until this time next year. So if it's this time next year, if you say, okay, well, I just need it done by spring. Well, you got a couple of months before you need to pull the trigger. But if you say, oh God, I needed it done by the holidays. Well, we might still be able to do it, but uh, I want you to know, think about this. Um, getting The clock doesn't start until we drop off something with the city. So all this talk that we're doing right now, we're still sitting in the car. At some point, we got to get out of the car and get in that long line at Disneyland. Now, by the way, that long line at Disneyland is just to get in. Once we get in to, through that long line and we get in, we still got to get in a line to get on a ride. That's the way the planning works. So you decide when's the latest you want your project, but I think the clock... I mean, the clock doesn't start until we drop something off with the, with the city. I like to say that if we met and we started designing, I'd like to have a design concept done in three weeks, a floor plan. And then if we can say that within six weeks of getting started, I have architectural plans, engineering, and your Title 24 and your low impact development, four sets of plans ready to go, we are ready to drop it off by the city. I'd like to say that if we could get that done, be within six to eight weeks at the most from getting from day one, we are on what I would call on track, on schedule. Then we get in line with the city. So I think what you you want to do after you get your loan approval is you need to you need to get designing quickly with someone, hopefully us. Okay. So well, Vic, well, I think we want to give them a tour of uh, the office and then meet the design team. And then that's it for tonight. We, uh, uh, we've got a short video to show you the, who the design team is and uh, the office, and then we will. Uh... Oh, hang on, Vic. Hang on. I have one more thing I wanted to show. Okay. Did I mess you up? No, no, go for it. Okay. It's a, it won't let me. It won't let me share. Okay. Uh, let me go back to my other screen. If it doesn't let you share, let me know. Okay, I hey guys, just if you guys uh, don't have the link to schedule the time to speak with us, you can always go to our website and uh, you can access basically get access to us through our website as well. So okay, we'll your I want to reach out to you. Okay, so I wanted to talk about next next month's webinar on what's coming up. Let me find my screen. Okay. Uh, here we go. Let me just show you. Okay. So we're going to show you a quick video 
Uh, if you want to do a screenshot of my info, there you go. But coming up in April, and I believe the first is on a Sunday. So we want to do Wednesday. I believe it's going to be Wednesday. Um, the 4th okay. is April 4th. April. Wednesday, April 4th. Okay. Uh, April 5th. Sorry about it. Uh, we, topics we're going to talk about is sloped properties. So some of you have properties that are on a slope and you're um, confounded on how to deal with that and, and create a budget. There's a couple of different um, engineering options that you can do, including design ideas and how to budget that project so you own it and it doesn't own you. The other thing we have a lot of questions on lately is why are second story projects so expensive? I'm going to give you the facts, the warnings, and the engineering design solutions and how to budget for second story projects. We are going to start talking about multifamily properties. So anybody that's got multifamily properties that you're saying, hey, I want to increase, increase my rental cap rate on that. What can we do? Uh, we'll also talk about more financing solutions. Meredith, we're going to invite you back, of course. And then uh, if there's any news regarding CalHAFA grants within the next 30 days, we'll update you on that. So that's all I wanted to say. That's coming up on the Wednesday, April 5th show. Okay, Vic, back to you. Yeah. Okay, we have one last item before we wrap it up for tonight's show. Please stay on two more minutes and meet the architectural design team in a short video and tour of our offices in Glendale. We hope you'll subscribe to our monthly webinar as we have new ideas on ADU design tips, value engineering ideas, controlling your construction budget, and listening to new speakers each month to get a variety of advice and recommendations for your own ADU projects. Thanks for coming and we'll see you next month. Welcome friends to ADU Resource Center in beautiful downtown Glendale, California, right on Brand Avenue in the U.S. Bank Building, where we have plenty of free parking. Come on up to the fifth floor and say hi to our design team. While we take a short elevator ride up, I'll tell you a little bit about our company and what our services are. ADU Resource Center is a one-stop shop, and that simply means we take care of everything relating to the project. That means anything from architectural designs, structural engineering, Title 24 energy calculations, low impact development calculations, and permit expediting. The design team is on staff. We do everything on the fifth floor. And as we walk into the building, you'll notice two conference tables for our customers so they can come down and sit with us and design and look at the big screen and figure things out together. During peak season, we might have several customers in at the same time. So we offer private rooms so that we can keep privacy and noise down. This is our private conference room with a beautiful view of the San Gabriel Valley Mountains. And what a view. Does it help us design better with inspiration? You better believe it does. So the next room we're going to go into is the architectural design room where Santa's little helpers do all their magic. Well, that about wraps up our quick office tour. I hope you enjoyed it. Here's the printer where we print out all your plans. Come on down to ADU Resource and let us help get started on your design.